Hey everyone, so today's lesson we are going to be focusing in on accelerated motion where velocity is not constant. So let's get started. So just to reestablish where we were at the end of last class. So we were looking at um, relationships between displacement and time for an accelerating object. And we found that when we graphed those two against each other, uh, there was a quadratic relationship that displacement varies with time squared. Um, and then the slope of that line gives us the instantaneous velocity of the object. So just as the slope of a displacement versus time graph gave us velocity for constant velocity, the same is true for an accelerating object. It's just that that slope is constantly changing as the object is speeding up or slowing down. Um, and if we look at that change in slope each second or the change in velocity each second, we can figure out then the acceleration of our object. So we ended up with a graph that looks something like this, where we have this curve upwards, this half of a parabola, and our best fit line gave us the formula that displacement is equal to one half of the acceleration times time squared. So let's take a moment to actually define acceleration then. So acceleration is really just the rate of change in velocity, um, or in other words, how much our velocity is changing each second that an object is moving. Um, and so converting that definition into a formula, we have acceleration is equal to delta V, change in velocity, over time. Now what you may notice here is that acceleration is measured in meters per second squared, which is sort of a weird unit because like, what is a square second? Like that, <laughs> that doesn't really mean anything. But what it actually is, is we're looking at meters per second, which is the unit of velocity, per second, which is the unit of time. So by dividing velocity by time or change in velocity by time, we end up with meters per second per second. And if we want to simplify that down, since we're dividing by seconds twice, that's what ends up giving us our meters per second squared. So that meters per second is our change in velocity. The seconds there are a measure of time. Now let's take a moment just to check in and see, based on this logic, could we measure an acceleration in a unit of feet per second per year? Would that work as an acceleration unit? Well, although those would be sort of unusual units and not typical for a scientific setting, you absolutely could measure an acceleration in feet per second Per year, if you wanted to see how someone's maximum speed is changing over the course of their lifetime um, and see that that sort of change in their maximum velocity, we could do something like that. If we're looking at, you know, continental drift or something like that, there could be situations where we would have that unit. So ultimately, any units can work for acceleration as long as it's a unit of velocity, which is displacement over time divided by another unit of time. So feet per second per year, meters per second per second, inches per hour per century, whatever you want, all of those would work for measuring acceleration. Okay, so let's try using this, uh, this definition out. So say we've got a motorcycle, it's moving at 15 meters per second, and then, oh my gosh, there is a family of ducks crossing the street, motorcycle has to stop, so it uh, hits the brakes, experiences an acceleration then of negative three meters per second squared, the negative indicating that this, uh, this motorcycle is slowing down. Um, how long is it gonna take for this motorcycle to come to a complete stop? Try it out on your own first. So working through this, I'm gonna make a list of everything that I know about this situation. So the motorcycle's starting off at 15 meters per second. It's trying to have a velocity of zero because if it's stopped, it's not moving, zero velocity. So that would be a change in velocity of negative 15 meters per second. And uh, the way that we're getting there is through an acceleration of negative three meters per second per second, and we're solving for the time. So now we can plug everything into our equation here. So acceleration is change in velocity over time. We can rearrange that to solve for time, which gives us that time is equal to change in velocity over acceleration. And if I plug all those things in, negative 15 divided by negative three gives me five seconds that it will take before our, our motorcycle comes to a stop. Right. Now, a couple things to know about accelerations. Acceleration is a change in velocity, and velocity is speed and direction, which means that acceleration or change in velocity could be an increase in speed, it could be a decrease in speed, or it could be a change in the direction that an object is moving. So an object that's moving in a circle at a constant speed is still always accelerating because its velocity keeps changing because its direction keeps changing. 
something to note there. All right. And so this also brings us to this idea that acceleration is a vector. We saw a couple slides ago that we had an acceleration of negative three meters per second squared. Things can only be negative if they are vectors. So direction matters for acceleration. Now, if we have an object uh, that has a velocity and acceleration in the same direction, so an object's moving to the north and it's experiencing an acceleration, a push to the north as well, what we would expect is that that object would get faster. If, on the other hand, the velocity and the acceleration are in opposite directions, so like you've got an object moving to the right, but then the fan is trying to push it back to the left in the opposite direction, then what we find is that the object slows down, and if that acceleration continues, the object might even then come to a stop eventually and turn around and go the other direction. Okay. So then um, we have all these different variables now that we've talked about so far. We've talked about displacement, we've talked about time, we've talked about velocity, we've talked about acceleration. Um, and so it turns out we can put all of those together in a variety of different ways, which brings us to our four kinematics formulas, which you see right here. So we've got five different variables that can show up here. There's displacement represented by D. There's um, velocity, but the thing with acceleration is that velocity is changing. So we have to be clear about when that velocity was taking place. So there are two different types of velocity that we might consider for an acceleration problem. We might be interested in the velocity at the beginning of the journey, which we would call initial velocity, VI, or we might have some information about the velocity at the end of the journey, after the acceleration has taken place, um, in which case we'd be focusing on VF for final velocity. And then of course we have acceleration, which is A, and time represented by T. Now these formulas look kind of crazy, some of them, but I just want to walk you through because three of these we've already sort of talked about just in a slightly different way. All right. So this first equation here, D equals one half VI plus VF times T, that's really just the same as our old average velocity equation from when we were talking about constant velocity. Because if you take initial velocity and final velocity and add them together and divide by two, that's just the average velocity between the beginning and the end. So same exact thing, just written out a slightly different way. Okay. So this second equation is just the same as the definition of acceleration from before, just rearranged and written a slightly different way. Third equation, this we got from our graph. When we graph displacement versus time for an accelerating object, we got d equals one half a t squared. We didn't see the first part because our object was starting from rest. But if an object doesn't start from rest and starts accelerating, then we get a little extra vertical offset, which is where that initial velocity times time comes from at the beginning of this formula. And then there's the fourth formula. And this one just doesn't make a ton of sense yet. It will more when we talk about energy. But in the meantime, it just kind of works when you put the other equations together and kind of rearrange things and solve. So we're just going to go with it. And that's going to be fine for us. Okay. Um, so let's look at acceleration another way. Come back to this idea of graphing acceleration. So we know that for a position versus time or displacement versus time graph, the slope gives us the velocity of the object. So just to recap what we've talked about before, if we have straight lines on a position versus time graph, that object's moving at a constant velocity. If we had curved lines where the slope is changing, the object must be accelerating. It must be experiencing a change in velocity. So let's break that down a little bit with the graph that you see right here. All right, so let's start with the zero to two second interval here, where we see that the, the curve uh, starts off pretty flat and then is getting steeper. Um, take a moment to try to identify what is that object doing during that time? Well, what I see here is that the slope starts off pretty close to zero, and zero slope means zero velocity, means not moving. But then as the slope gets steeper and more positive, we see that the object is speeding up and moving in the positive direction because the slope is overall positive. So that's what we see here uh, with this first type of curve here. Let's move on to the second uh, interval of two seconds, from two to four seconds here. Um, what's the object doing here? Well, what I'm seeing is that the object still has a, a positive slope overall, which means it's still moving in the positive direction, has a positive velocity, but it's getting shallower over time. We're going from a really high slope to kind of a lower slope here. And so that tells me that this object is slowing down because its slope is getting smaller, still moving in the positive direction though. Okay. How about from four to six seconds? What's the object doing here? 
Well, at this point, what I'm seeing for this object is that it's now moving in the negative direction because we have a negative slope. So this object has now changed around and is moving backwards or down or south or whatever we're calling the negative direction. Um, and it starts off at a pretty level kind of slope and then it's getting steeper and steeper and steeper over time. So that tells me that it's moving in the negative direction and it's speeding up. So that's what's happening in this third region of this graph. And lastly, let's see, can we put it all together? What's happening in this fourth region of the graph for 68 seconds? All right, so what I'm seeing is it's still moving in the negative direction because it's still got a negative slope, but here the slope is getting shallower over time. We're getting closer and closer to a slope of zero, which represents being stopped. So that tells me that this object must be slowing down as it's moving in the negative direction. So those are all the different ways that we can see acceleration on a graph. So lastly, just to check in, see how you understand everything, which of the following would be an example of acceleration? It could be more than one, it could be just one of them, it could be none of them. Going from zero to 60, hitting the brakes on your bicycle, or ice skating in a figure eight shape. Well, if you guessed all of them, you are correct, because all of those represent a change in velocity. Um, the first two, we see a change in speed. The last one, maybe we're not changing speed, but we're definitely changing direction. And so both of those, all of those, represent a change in velocity, which means an acceleration is taking place. That's it, folks. Hope that helped you understand velocity and acceleration a little bit better.